thought that I would share um, a little bit of the story of how we confronted the beginning of the heroin epidemic in North Alabama. Obviously, not completely successful, <clears throat> probably never completely successful in eradicating these kind of addiction episodes, um, epidemics really in this case. But I think it's a, it's a good tale about what's possible and how you can do an even better job than what we did in this situation. So at the risk of having just ruined everybody's lunch, <laughs> I'll tell you that that video really is the right starting point for us. One of the key pieces is that six or seven years ago, the federal government forced the manufacture of OxyContin to reformulate it. OxyContin used to be sold in a formulation where it could be crushed and diluted and injected, and people were using that to get high and the federal government forced the manufacturer to go to a gel non-soluble form. And only in hindsight do we see the origins of the heroin epidemic in that and, and probably other situations, but very much starting with pills. It seems really obvious in 2017 that we're in the middle of a major uh, opioid epidemic, that it has both an illegal drug component, heroin, fentanyl, and other related drugs, but also a legal drug component, prescription medications in the opioid family. It's the leading cause of death in many demographics in many places across the country. And President Trump has recently confirmed in his uh, message to the public that he too believes that there's an epidemic. It's an interesting epidemic, at least uh, in this way too. It's very personal. Most people that you talk to will know someone who's overdosed or will know a family that had a child or a family member that overdosed or will have someone that they work with who's been in this situation. And so in 25 years uh, as a federal prosecutor, you can imagine I lived through a bunch of different waves of drugs, through crack cocaine and through meth and on into heroin um, via some of the designer drugs that, that got us there. And really, this one is the most surprising to me because once we got involved in this work, no matter where I went, someone would come up to me and say, I lost my niece, I lost my daughter, I lost my son. And although initially many of the victims seemed to be running white and upper middle class, as we worked into the epidemic, it became unfortunately more of an equal opportunity killer um, losing, for instance, at UAB, a promising young black artist, um, using, losing people in the Hispanic community. It had no respect any longer for, for age, for race, or for economic status. Much less obvious than the fact that we're in the middle of an epidemic is who's responsible for it, and, and what do we do to resolve it? Um, we're several years into awareness that this epidemic is raging in many parts of the country. There's still not a clear path forward. And so the crisis so shows no signs of stopping. Um, the pace of addiction and death is so fast in some locations that the statistics really are not valuable because they are so overwhelming. Um, pioneering effective interventions are necessary, but they'll only get us so far. The complexity of the crisis requires that we have medical, legislative, behavioral, educational, and legal changes and it requires that we have all of those at the same time. Lots and lots of different moving parts and players who don't necessarily work together, typically. The path forward really does involve bringing unconventional partners together, and that's why I'm so glad to have the chance to talk with you all today, because with your professional training, you're really, I think, in many ways, ground zero both for understanding these sorts of problems and also for assessing the types of stakeholders and partners who have to come together to address them. 
So states and communities can succeed, and there has been some success in this work, when they uh, align community partnerships and bring people together. Uh, you have to work simultaneously on destigmatization, on education and awareness that there's a problem, on treatment, on prevention, but you also have to do that in coordination with law enforcement because there are, as basic economic theory would tell us, two aspects to this problem. There is definitely a demand side and that falls more within the medical wheelhouse, but there's also a supply side and that's law enforcement's job to interdict the supply of drugs in a meaningful way. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, Fortunately, action has been taken in the last few years on both the national and the state level. There has been some good legislation on the national side of things, including CDC's recent guidelines, which do a better job of helping prescriptions provide opioids appropriately to avoid the rapid onset addiction that we were seeing, with some people being susceptible to addiction in as few as three weeks, while often standard prescription practices would involve giving, for instance, a woman who had a C-section 60 days worth of pills. Instant addict. We're moving past that and using much more conservative prescription uh, policies that will limit that. States like Alabama have uh, implemented drug courts, one of the most effective ways that the criminal justice system can work to support addicts in recovery. Put an addict in jail and they will undoubtedly come out an addict perhaps with worse problems. Put an addict into treatment and they will have a much better opportunity to succeed. In many states, though, there have been other steps. Narcotics detectives and emergency medical technicians have become trusted case managers and have helped people seek treatment and find treatment. Some medical examiners are serving as physician educators. These efforts are very encouraging. Frankly, though, they are not uh, taking place in Alabama, where all too often our county district attorneys continue to lock up pregnant addicts out of a misguided belief that that's the best they can do for them but we can do better. So how we got to the point we're at today, and I'll talk with you towards the end of my talk about the community engaged initiative that we now have in Birmingham, but how we got there uh, is in many ways a story of, of good fortune in the middle of bad fortune. Sometime in early 2011, we began to hear about heroin deaths um, in this county. And I had been in the U.S. Attorney's Office for 20 years at this point. And in all of that time, we had prosecuted only one heroin case. It was actually my case. It was a defendant named Buster Lee Jackson. I've never forgotten him. And he was charged with bringing a kilogram of heroin into Birmingham. And at that time, it was really an aberration, probably 1992 or 1993. We really didn't see heroin being brought into this community. We saw cocaine, we saw crack cocaine, we saw meth, we saw marijuana, we even saw a little bit of LSD and drugs on that spectrum, but really didn't see heroin. Um, and then that summer of 2011, a classmate of my oldest child uh, died of a heroin overdose. She was in her second year in college. She had been studying in London. She came home for summer break. The kids all went out to dinner one night, and a week later, she was dead with a needle in her arm. And I had a conversation with the sheriff in the county that she lived in, and I said, it's such a terrible shame. I can't believe she went to London and got addicted there. And he said to me, oh, no, no. She didn't become an addict in London. She became an addict in Shelby County. In fact, I know who sold the drugs that killed her. And I said, Chris, do we have a problem with heroin? I'd seen a couple of stories, but nothing major. And he was one of those old-time sheriffs who had sort of come up through the ranks and really understood the community. Somebody who had always assessed problems, I thought, earlier than other people did. And he told me, we don't have a big problem, but if we're just losing two or three kids a year, that's a problem. And so I talked to the other sheriffs and some of the other police chiefs in Jefferson County and in some of the surrounding counties. Fun lawyer fact, as U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama, I had the 31 northernmost counties in the state. So everything in a line from roughly Shelby County running on up. And so I spoke with the chiefs. You know, we've got a lot of municipalities in Birmingham, which sort of amplifies some of our problems. 
talked with the chief over in Tuscaloosa, talked with folks a little bit north of Alabama and even out on the eastern side towards uh, Georgia, and they all told me, no, not really having a problem here, willing to come to a meeting. And so I convened a meeting with all of our folks, and they all said the same thing as we went around the room in, in response to the question, do we have a problem? They said, well, you know, I've had a couple of overdose deaths, 20-year-old kids, college kids, kids who had a history of athletics and some kind of a sports injury. And a couple of them even said, particularly in Hueytown, well, I've got an apartment complex where they're openly selling it. And as we went around the table and everyone had this response, by the time we got to the end, we looked at each other collectively and said, we, we've got a problem on our hands. We really do have a problem. And so because we're law enforcement folks, we did what we know how to do. We went out and we investigated. I prioritized all of my rather considerable investigative resources for drugs against the heroin threat. And we were, I'm gonna say, pretty successful. We rounded up some of the biggest heroin distributing organizations in North Alabama. Our focus was dismantle cartel-linked operations. We're talking about the big guys at the top of the food chain. Uh, disrupt the supply coming into the city. And so at one point, with the arrest of about 14 people who ran um, King of the Hill, the Billy Williams investigation, DEA's estimate was that we knocked out 30% of the heroin supply in Alabama just with that one series of arrests. But you all know what happened, right? Folks walked in and backfilled because the demand was so high that just knocking out the supply chain alone really wasn't very helpful. And after investigating, and I mean seriously, you know, guys working overtime taking this seriously because at this point they were seeing overdose death sites and there's really nothing um, as bad as seeing a 20-year-old kid dead with a needle in his arm. Um, so people really busting to, to make these cases work. We concluded that we could not arrest our way out of the problem. It was um, an unusual conclusion for law enforcement because, you know, we tend to believe that we can arrest our way um, out of any problem. But it just wasn't true. Chief Roper, Birmingham's police chief, called me up one afternoon and he said, I've just seen some new statistics. You're more likely to die of a heroin overdose death than of a gun-related violence incident in the city of Birmingham this year. And that was shocking to us because the myth of Birmingham is that it's a very violent city where people die from gunshot wounds. And although there is a high rate of gun violence in certain parts of the city, heroin really overtook that. A and even more horrific was that when you added prescription overdose deaths to heroin overdose deaths, they were just way off of the charts in terms of being the leading cause of death. We decided we needed to hold a community summit. And, and we needed to do that because every place I went, to Rotary Clubs or to PTAs, um, you know, I noticed that. I see you guys laughing. For the life of me, I cannot figure out why I'm the only person whose head is not cut off. But I think when you're the U.S. attorney, right, that happens. Um, but, you, you know, people just didn't believe that heroin was back. And I can remember speaking to the Rotary Club of Birmingham, which prides itself on being the second largest Rotary Club in the world. So it's lunch on a Wednesday, and there are hundreds of people. And someone asked the question, what keeps you up at night? And I said, heroin. And they, they just looked at me like, what are you talking about? That was in the 60s. Really, no one believed it. Um, so, you know, our decision was, sort of went like this. When the only tool in your toolkit is a hammer, all of the problems start to look like nails. And we needed to talk to people who had experience that was different from our own with different dynamics of the problem. And so I settled on, well, and I've hit my slides, Max Michael, who is the Dean of the School of Public Health, um, and Mark Wilson, who is the County Medical Health Officer. And to make it even worse, I bet some of you at least know who Sally Yates is, the former Deputy Attorney General in the Justice Department who was fired by President Trump. The tall guy standing next to me is actually her predecessor, the Deputy Attorney General Jim Cole, who became our partner in this. So I'm now going to have to call him and tell him I cut his head out of a picture, as important <laughs> as he is. Um, but it was a real unusual partnership. When I first reached out, to Mark and said, what are you doing about the heroin problem? He said, do we have a heroin problem? What should we be doing? 
and he was immediately open to and, and ready to conform to the idea that we had an issue we needed to address, which was such a blessing after really making no headway in the community and convincing people um, heroin was back. And of course, you all know Dean Michael, so I don't need to tell you how enthusiastic his response was. In the course of our first meeting, we realized that if we worked together, we were a lot better situated to address this problem than we were if we addressed it alone. Because my piece was the supply piece, and their piece was the demand piece. And of course, bringing those into alignment had to be the goal here. So our first summit was in 2014. Our goal really was to raise awareness of the problem. Um, the conference was entitled Pills to Needles, Combating uh, Rising Heroin Deaths, and we did that because one of our goals was to make explicit the connection between pills and needles. At this point, we realized that literally a majority of the overdose deaths we were seeing were student athletes or people who had had injuries, who had been diagnosed, who had been treated and given pain pills, and who traveled that route to addiction. It wasn't the exclusive route, but we saw it as being a predominant route. And so at this conference, which we just opened up to the public, and I remember two weeks beforehand, the guy in my office um, who runs programs like this for us came in and he was, you know, sort of Eeyore, doom and gloom. Boss, we've got this big room in Alumna House and nobody's gonna come. You know, we'll have 20 people there. And then the day that it happened, he kept coming in saying, fire marshal is gonna shut us down because we had an overcapacity crowd. Um, we brought together law enforcement, medical professionals, also educators, parents. Um, we were really surprised when, for instance, Dr. Bonner, who was then the president of the University of um, Alabama in Tuscaloosa, came over with nine of her staff people and spent the day with us. There was really a fulsome group and a lot of participation. And we developed community engagement unintentionally in this first summit. We had left the last meeting, which was um, sort of sponsored by Dr. Wilson, as just a feedback session, just wanted to hear what people thought the value of the conference had been to them. And it was really extraordinary. It was a frank discussion of problems that people were seeing. We had OBGYNs who were talking with us about the fact that they were treating heroin addicted patients for the first time in their careers and they had thought that it was just them and they were incredibly relieved to be in a room where they could talk about the issues. We heard during the summit from a recovering addict. We also heard from the family um, of a kid who didn't make it through an overdose. And that moving experience I think brought out really the best in this community and people stood up to say that they felt like we needed a process going forward. So it became clear by the end that we weren't having a one and done symposium we had a follow-up meeting about 30 days later. It was bigger than the symposium. We actually had to move to a larger venue to accommodate people. Um, and I had never heard the term community engaged initiative, which apparently is a term of art and a thing. We actually started calling this a community engaged initiative, not knowing that, because that was so clearly what it was. People coming in from the community, seeing their piece of the problem, and wanting to work together. Um, and we were really lucky. We were able to hire with some very limited funding a consultant who moderated this session and helped put together a strategic plan. Their story was the story of everybody else who touched this work. When the money ran out for the consultant to continue working, they simply kept working. And when I asked them about that at one point, you know, they're a for-profit organization. They said the problem is too important to leave it alone. I had the same experience in my office. People who made it their late night and weekend hobby, for instance, my press officer, whose job was not to work on a heroin initiative, simply decided that she would continue to work on it and made it her responsibility. We had that same response from teachers and educators, from people at Blue Cross, from folks who work here, and it was really a tremendous effort to try to deal with a problem that at this point really was overwhelming. The original members um, were uh, supplemented with folks from Homewood City Schools. Dr. Birdie from Birmingham Southern played a tremendous role, not just with educators, but also with bringing in the business community. The business community was really feeling the impact. Their employees were potential um, addicts. Their employees had family members who might be addicts. 
And they were starting to feel the impact and they were very willing to get engaged once we reached out to them. Same experience that we had had with the OBGYNs at our summit meeting. They were saying this is really a bad problem but we just haven't been talking about it. And so that was the value, I think, of continuing to um, build this group. Uh, I'm looking at my notes to make sure I don't leave anything out. I should tell you that Pills to Needles funders have included groups as varied as the Community Foundation, Blue Cross, the Justice Department, and Independent Presbyterian Church. So it really was sort of a run on a shoestring sort of initiative with that level of funding. But the initiative developed coalition building and strategic planning, and then it formed working groups. The six active working groups were formed around the key impact areas, public awareness, partnership with law enforcement, medical community engagement, research, policy, and access to treatment. And those working groups really became the heart of the initiative. One key element was our better understanding of the path to addiction. Um, and, and because heroin was so inexpensive at this point in time, and addiction could happen so quickly, early on in the initiative, we focused on building awareness and on education. We created, with help of UAB's digital media group, a website that I would encourage all of you to take a look at, nodope.org. The front page is a simple infographic that helps people understand that grandma's medicine cabinet can be the path to addition, uh, addiction for many unsuspecting young people. But it also has more detailed videos. The first piece you saw, the, the injection video, is one of the pieces that came off of this website. There is even a cartoonish piece um, that's uh, aimed at uh, young kids, middle school kids. And I learned one rainy afternoon when I roped all the kids on my street into our living room and turned on the computer and showed them all the kid video that they found it to be really funny and also really engaging. So the folks at Digital Media who did this work really knew what they were doing. The videos that are on the No Dope website were used to speak to students across the country. At first, we had a lot of resistance from high school principals who did not want us to come and speak to their kids. But as we were able to convince them and go out, many of us who did that work had really um, interesting experiences. After one speech um, that I gave at a, at a large high school, I had three boys walk up to me at the end. And you know, you could just tell, right, I've got teenage boys, so you know. There was one kid, and he had his two wingmen with him. And he looked at me, and he just said, I have a problem. I need help. Um, and fortunately, his mom was a pediatrician and we were able to engage with the family pretty quickly. But I think when you have that kind of an experience, you understand the value of the work and why it has to move forward. I also had one young man at another high school, he wanted to raise the argument that the best thing that we could do to defeat the opioid crisis was to legalize <coughs> marijuana. And as I looked at the very conservative leadership at his school who were expecting me to respond, I thought, wow, I sort of got in over my head on this one, didn't I? <laughs> Um, but that's an interesting question that he raised and perhaps something that you guys will find the answer to at some point. So the initiative really has provided a lot of deliverables in the last three years as part of its work. Um, at the end of my term as U.S. Attorney, I resigned in January of this year and we've actually transitioned the leadership of the initiative into Dr. Wilson's office so that it now lives with the Jefferson County Health Department they were able to get some funding, so there's a graduate student who's assigned to continually run it. And our hope is that it will stay in place, that it will help us make great um, inroads into the heroin epidemic, but it will also learn how to deal with addictive episodes so that whatever the next drug wave is, it will be in place to deal with that. Something that you learn if you work in this area is that today's heroin epidemic that looks like it will never break, actually will break at some point and then there will be a next drug. We were behind the curve. By the time we really realized that we had a heroin epidemic and we needed to do more than arrest people, we were just completely behind the game. Our hope is that this initiative provides some architecture and some infrastructure so we're not behind the next time this happens. I'll tell you that I think the most important deliverable, well, they're all important, but my, I think the one that's really had enormous impact 
is the drug Narcan or Naloxone, which can be easily administered to someone who's having an OD and will bring them back almost miraculously. As one of my police chiefs um, likes to say, it will bring them back so that four hours later we can go out and find them buying heroin again. But it keeps people from dying. When we first started talking about that in this state, people just sort of gave you the evil eye. No, we're not going to do something to help addicts. Or why should we make this drug available? And really, by strength of will, folks in the medical group engaged with the legislature, made um, it legal, not just for addicts, but for their family members to have naloxone in this state. Dr. Wilson led a program in Jefferson County where he wrote a standing prescription so that anybody could walk into a pharmacy and get it. And it's now available statewide. Just this month, 600 dosage units have been handed out to law enforcement um, officers working in conjunction with the newly created Governor's Task Force on Opioids and Addiction. So we continue to make progress, all led by this little shoestring initiative in Jefferson County. Just as we began to think we had a sense of what the problems were and what we needed to do, the epidemic evolved. And that is maybe the most important lesson of all. It's never a standing target. We were silly to think that it might be. Fentanyl started to be introduced into the drug supply. We were seeing kilogram quantities of heroin, which I don't know if y'all have ever seen. I should put back the photo from the beginning. But they come in in blocks, and the cartels actually like to put a label on them. I mean, they brand their heroin. You know, this is heroin that's coming in from MI6 or, or whatever the gang is. Um, we began to see what looked like kilograms of heroin, and it was kilograms of fentanyl. And it was stunning because fentanyl is so much more lethal than heroin is. In fact, it poses a risk to law enforcement. And there have been incidents of skin contamination. And law enforcement has completely had to redo its standards for handling search warrants and situations where they believe fentanyl is in a residence because of the risk. But let me give you some statistics about what happened once fentanyl came into our, our drug supply. Jefferson County had 248 drug overdeaths in 2016. That was a 12% increase over the previous year. Because our initiative in Birmingham began so early, and I, I guess I should share with you the fact that because of our, the, just the connections here, we did get onto the heroin problem early in Jefferson County, whereas it didn't emerge on the national radar screen until maybe late 2015, in some places 2016. Um, but we were making progress. We were bringing overdose death rates down. And then fentanyl happened with that 12% increase last year in 16. Of those 248 deaths, 205 involved a combination of heroin and fentanyl. So it was incredibly, incredibly lethal. Um, the evolving nature of this epidemic means we need to stay on top of it. We know there's some intelligence that KR fentanyl, a still more lethal drug, is possibly being introduced into the supply. And we also know that today's addicts aren't as sophisticated as the addicts were in the 1960s. No one's really sure why, but in the 60s, addicts had a habit of shooting just a little bit of the mixture into their arm, gauging its strength before they injected. That doesn't seem to happen anymore, and people just really stick the full plunger in. Um, you can't test the strength of heroin like you can some drugs by coddling a little bit of the mixture in a spoon. And so with these increasingly risky drugs and increasingly toxic drugs injected into the mix, we expect, quite frankly, that the overdose death rate is going to continue to skyrocket. So what can you do? It's a really interesting question, and it's probably not one that I'm qualified to answer because I don't have your training and your background. But what I can perhaps share with you is what law enforcement wishes the medical community would do. And perhaps that will have some predictive value in helping um, you assess what, if any, role you could play in this sort of setting. So a major need in our community is treatment. I, I was on a um, seminar up in Maine on heroin a couple of years ago where they have just a terrible heroin problem. And I went up and I was on a panel with a judge who ran a drug court. And she was talking about her problem, which was identifying people who needed treatment. 
And she had a, a program that she ran, and she had 30 beds that were committed to her program. She had access to another 30 beds, and she never ran out of space there, but if she did, she said she could go to another facility for space. And I was flabbergasted by that, because this happened at a point in time where down here, I knew about a case involving a young man who had been a heroin addict for close to a decade and had decided he wanted to seek treatment. And it took him 11 weeks from the day he made that decision until the day he could get an intake appointment. And that is a lifetime, or maybe even a death sentence, for a heroin addict. After he had his intake appointment, he had to wait another three months until he was able to get into an inpatient treatment facility. His mom told me she went with him to get heroin the last day before he went into treatment with her Narcon in hand because she wanted to make sure he made it in there alive. She told me that she never anticipated that in her life she would be out on the streets buying heroin with her kid, but she felt like it was the only way she could keep him safe. And what makes that story, I think, even more distressing is that this was a family with means. This was a family that had access to paying for certain kinds of things, and that even with that, treatment was really inaccessible in this community. It's a little bit better now. A lot of that turns on what kind of treatment you want to get, right? Some people want drug-assisted treatment. Other people think that that's the mark of the beast. Um, I don't have the professional expertise to understand the distinction, but people have very strong feelings about the right types of facilities. Whatever the right types of facilities and treatment are, we have a desperate need to develop those here. And something I think we're fortunate to have is UAB, where we have that flexibility to develop programs, and I think where there's actually a willingness on the part of the university to do that. No matter where you anticipate finding yourself in your professional life, I would encourage you, though, to continue to educate yourself about this problem. Make sure you know what the signs of addiction are. Make sure that you know how to steer someone who is an addict to treatment. And one of the most important and most difficult, frankly, to reconcile issues we found about, out about was dealing with stigma. Virtually no one wants to talk about addiction. Admitting that your child is a heroin addict means that you have done something wrong as a parent, right? Admitting that you or your spouse are an addict means that you're a failure. People are afraid to talk about addiction and we have to talk with them in the language of medical trauma and say it's like having a broken leg or like having asthma. You happen to have a body that succumbed to addiction. It's a medical issue. You need treatment, not banishment from your family and your community. But that is a really tough piece to decipher, and I think pretty firmly, right, within the area within which you guys all work. Encouraging sound prescription practices is one of the most important steps we can continue to take. I had this really difficult experience last year where I spoke at a pain seminar that was being put on at the Weston for Doctors, and I was on the panel with some doctors, and we were talking with a really large room full of physicians who were very engaged on this topic. And they were looking to me and saying, well, how many days of supply should we prescribe? You know, and I don't have any idea. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, and I can't answer those kind of questions. And the fact that physicians were really searching with such difficulty for answers that they thought that they would ask a U.S. attorney about prescription practices really told me that we need to do a better job of getting guidance for doctors in this area. We need to encourage doctors to use the online systems that let them detect pill seekers and, and help those people find treatment. And we need to provide support for doctors, you know, many of whom are going to have been out of medical school for 20 or 30 years. And we need to help them update their prescription practices. Doctors and other medical professionals can also play an incredibly important role, as I have learned, in interacting with the legislature and in encouraging legislatures to develop good laws and good policies, and also giving them cover for those new laws. For instance, Alabama now has safe harbor legislation. Five years ago, the 22-year-old daughter of a Birmingham lawyer at a large law firm was shooting up heroin with three friends. She began to overdose. They left her in the apartment and left. 
left her there alone to die. If she had been taken to a hospital, if 911 had called, she probably would have survived that overdose. But if they had done that, they would have been subjected to prosecution. So they left her. There's now safe harbor legislation in this state that says that if you're shooting up with someone and you call the police or go to the emergency room, you won't be charged with possession of a small amount of, mar of uh, heroin. That's an enormous step forward. But let me share with you a somewhat more radical thought, particularly in Alabama. And it's not needle exchanges, which I'm going to tell you are still out of reach for us. It's the idea of safe shooting locations. I've got a friend who's just returned from a trip to Europe. He, like I, works in the area of criminal justice reform. And so he saw both in Scandinavia and in Amsterdam these facilities that are medical facilities. They're maintained by doctors and addicts can come in and have access to safe needles and they can shoot up there. And it sounds really counterintuitive. I mean, I gotta tell you, for somebody coming from law enforcement, it sounds really counterintuitive. But if it's what you have to do to save their lives and get them into treatment, then it makes a lot of sense to study those kind of policies, to see if you can have data that validates them, right? I'm, I'm big on using data if you're gonna take a, a big bold step like this. You need to make sure that it's gonna work, that it's not gonna be counterproductive or simply encourage addiction. You need to make sure that it helps. The data from Denmark suggests that it works there. I think that there's also a location in Canada, maybe in Toronto, that's using a similar policy. We should be looking at those sorts um, of solutions. Doctors play a key role, medical professionals play a key role in convincing legislators that they should adopt these kind of policies. And that really leads me, I think, to the final point that I would make about the job that law enforcement and the medical community and educators need to do together, which is we need to replace the tough on crime mentality that pervades so much of law enforcement's work in drugs. Tough on crime sounds really good. If you arrest people, then they can no longer harm themselves with drugs or sell them to others. But we know in too many cases, law enforcement has focused on arresting users or low-level dealers, filling up our jails with those people. That's why it was so important to me when we took on law enforcement work in this area to ensure that we were focusing on cartel-linked groups that were distributing because my gut sense told me that those were the people that belonged in jail and that if we went after those groups, we could maximize the amount of heroin we took off the streets rather than going after low-level dealers. But of course, priorities in law enforcement change and as we were return to a, a tough on crime, sort of a law enforcement policy, I fear that we will sacrifice some of the gains that we have made and so I would encourage folks like you, when you have the opportunity to interact with policymakers and with others, to suggest that we adopt smart on crime policies, where we use data-driven approaches that we know succeed, where we rely on evidence-based best practices, not on, if I'm tough on crime, the voters will re-elect me. So that's a little bit of a um, political dance that has to be done to ensure success in this area. I'm going to close with one more um, slide, that uh, one of the videos that was created by UAB Digital Media for us. Um, these are the words of a father because the son's not here to share his words with us. This young man had a perfect ACT score at Vestavia Hills High School. His Sunday school teacher was one of the prosecutors in my office. Um, we can't afford to lose people like this in our community. And at the end of the day, this is why the work matters so much. I went to see him because we were concerned. And he said, look at me. Do I look like I'm on drugs? So I said, no, you look great. So, but I'm coming back in a couple of days and I want to bring a drug test with me and we're going to make sure. And it was that day when I pulled into the uh, apartment complex, I pulled in behind the ambulance. I kept praying, please don't turn toward his apartment. Of course it did.
So you all are entering into the right profession at the right time to make a difference.